This is Allie from Sun City Church and we are doing Hot Ones. It's the show with hot questions and even hotter wings. Today, I'm joined by our Connections Pastor, Jason Marazzo. In the Bible, there's a story where Jesus feeds 5,000 people. If you had to feed 5,000 people, what food would you multiply? I'm a big Italian food fan. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I would definitely multiply cannolis. This wing is your friend, okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it does. It does. There's some crazy stories in the Bible, like prophets who literally go around with no clothes on to like get the word across. What is the craziest thing you've ever witnessed? Oh man, probably on our, our last mission trips to Africa, we've seen some people carrying some crazy things. A motorcycle on a motorcycle, no which way. is really interesting. They're I'm sure very... OSHA would have a field day. Yeah, there's no such thing as OSHA over there, I don't think. Right. Yeah, so it there's was... just an ocean, big difference. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Nailed it. Yes. Well, everyone, thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you next week. Oh, it's really good. <laughs> Let's give it up for Pastor Jason. So, so fun. Well, um, I'm having fun already today. Who else is having fun? Yes. Oh, man, we've been having so much fun at Summer Blast, and it just continues on today as we're talking about the Bible and how to read it right. I so loved Pastor Danny's message last week. If you're just catching up today, I would strongly encourage you to go back, listen to that message. But we're talking about the Bible, and it is an interesting, interesting book, right? Like, what other book do we read that's thousands of years old, right? Like, what other book... Like, do we talk about, have whole series is about, have like unpack all of this stuff. And, and honestly, if I'm being honest, it's hard to understand. Like, like, how do you reconcile some of the crazy stuff that happens in the Old Testament with Jesus in the New Testament? Am I right? Like even prophets like Ali was talking about, the walk around naked. Like, really, God? Like, if, if God told me to do that, I'd have to, like, get some confirmation first, right? There was, a, there was a prophet one time that had to lay on his side for hundreds of days eating food cooked by, like, dung, Cow dung. Gross. God told him to do that. It's a hard book to understand. So today I figured what we would do is we would talk about what is this book all about. And to get some help, um, last week in Sun City Kids, I took our camera team in the back and I asked some of my friends, um, hey, what do you think the Bible is all about? So let's check out this video really quick. Today in class, you guys are talking about the Bible, right? Yeah. Guess what? In big church, I'm going to talk about the Bible and I was just going to ask you some questions about the Bible. Is that cool? Okay, so what do you guys think the Bible is all about? What would you say? What is the Bible all about? God. God. Yeah. And, and things. What's in the Bible? What are some stories that you read in the Bible? Uh, Goliath. Goliath is in the Bible. Yep, he's big. The Bible is about God saving us from our sins. Ooh, nice. What do you think, Wyatt? Um, God's word. It's God's word. Yeah. Like if an alien came down out of the space and you, he showed you a Bible and he said, Rowdy, what is this all about? What would you say the Bible is all about? 66 books. Ooh, that's good. You know that. High five. There's 66 books in the Bible. Nice. What is, what is God's story all about? It's about him saving us from, from our sins. Nice. I like that. Do you know what? When you're at church, almost always the right answer is Jesus. Do you want to test it out? Watch. Who loves you the most? Jesus. Yes. Who died for your sins? Jesus. Who created the whole entire world? God. Well, they're kind of the same. But yes, Jesus, right? Isn't that cool? It's almost always the right answer. Lucy, what would you say? What is the Bible all about? Jesus. The Bible's all about Jesus? Yeah. Yeah. Good job. High five. Yeah. Love it, love it. Let's give it up again for our Sun City kids. Oh, man, like ever since we started Sun City Church, when we started the church, my wife and I, we got to be the kids' pastors. I still hope, help oversee kids, and I just, I love it. I love the wonder. I love just like, you know, even Ali was talking about, like we approach, or Shalom was talking about, we approach God with that childlike faith. And so today, even as we continue into this message, let's just take that same attitude and that same approach. Sound good? So we're going to dive in. And I figured today, as we're talking about what is the Bible all about, just really simple format, right off the top, I just thought we would go back to school. Do you guys remember who, what, where, when, why, how? Yeah, let's just do that. Does that sound good? 
Let's just go through and like talk about who is in the Bible, who wrote the Bible, what is the Bible, how does it work, where was it written, when was it written, and then why did the Bi- people like write the Bible? Does that sound good? As I was like praying and preparing, I was like, let's just make this simple for all of us. So if you're taking notes, which you should, because it helps, okay, because it's early and you probably hadn't have enough coffee yet, and then later someone's asking you a question, like, like, did you ever drive home when you were a kid? And like that inevitable, you're driving home, you're in the back seat, and your mom says, what did you learn in church today? Right? That fearful, fateful question. Man, I remember sitting in church sometimes, and I would just listen for that one point, Like, if I could just get that one point and catalog it, then I could check out for the rest of church. Anybody else? No, of course not. No, you guys are like Christians and you love Jesus. So you take notes because someone's going to ask you, what do they talk about in church today? So here we go. We're going to dive in. Who, what, where, when, why? Okay, first off, who wrote the Bible? Who is the audience of the Bible? Who's the main character? Right? That's an important question. Those are important questions to a- answer. Who wrote it? I love this last week. If you listen to Pastor Danny's message, there was over 40 different authors, right? They were fishermen, businessmen, tax collectors. There was farmers. There were shepherds. There was doctors. Some were educated. Some were even uneducated. I love that. Written by tons of different people. Um, but here's the deal. There's no contradiction uh, because there is one author, okay? Type, like if you're taking notes, write one author with a big A, right? We all know that is God. I love when the Bible says that the Word of God is inspired. It's breathed out by God. So yes, men, they held the pen, but Jesus inspired their words as they were writing them. And it's just beautiful. It's written over, uh, you know, thousands of years, and just the fact that it's all congruent, it all works together. Danny talked about this last week. It was written in three different languages, Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic, but again, it's one message. So beautiful. Who is the intended audience? As we're talking about who wrote it, but who is the intended audience? This is so important for us as American Christians to realize this is big. If you're taking notes, write this one down. The Bible was written for us, but the Bible wasn't written to us. That is huge. If we can just remember even that as we're trying to read this Bible, the Bible is written for us. It was written down for you and for me, but it wasn't written to us. Because there's honestly, primarily, it was written to the Jewish people, especially the Old Testament. God picked them and said, you're my chosen people. So a lot of the Old Testament was written to the Jewish people. And then as we get into the New Testament, it was still written to the Jewish people, but began to include Romans and Gentiles and, you know, those of us like that aren't like the Jewish uh, descent, right? So again, not written to us, but man, certainly written for us. We can apply it and it can rock our world. Um, I love uh, just even this idea. When we think about that part of the world, like the Eastern part of the world, even the way, if you're an Eastern person, the way you think is different than a Westerner, right? Let me prove it to you, okay? I dove in today and I was like, I'm gonna teach you about the Bible and we're gonna lay it out like this. Who, what, where, when, why, how? And I'm gonna give you all the facts and all the points and you're ready to take notes because that's the way you and I learn. That's the way we were educated. That's the way our brains work. Now, if we would like hop over the ocean and be like, like more of an Eastern kind of you know, church setting education, what I would do is I would come up here and I would tell you a really cool story for 30 minutes. Okay, I would tell you a beautiful story and I'd interweave like allegory and analogy and I would hide this incredible like nugget of truth right in the middle and then at the end I would wrap it all up and it would all make sense and then some people would be like, oh wow, because they're all tied into that one nugget of truth I hid in the middle. That's the way it works. Like in the Eastern thought, it's not just I'm gonna didactically teach through all of these points and tell you how it is, but I'm gonna conceal truth. I'm gonna tell you maybe a proverb or maybe a parable or I'm gonna write poetry and I'm gonna let you discover the truth on your own. There's actually something really powerful to that, right? You know what I'm talking about? Like if someone just serves you a really cool meal, it's it's beautiful and you enjoy it, but have you ever made a really good meal? Oh, man, it just, it tastes different, right? And when you set it in front of somebody, you're just like, you're waiting for the reaction on their face, like to enjoy it. Think about when we approach the Bible that way. It's really similar. Like, honestly, these authors, they, they, they're serving up this meal and they're concealing God's incredible truth inside of it. And if we can approach it that way, just anticipating, what am I gonna learn today? What am I gonna get out of it? Instead of maybe crossing our arms and sitting back and saying, like, teach me something, God, right? It's like, what, you, what is in there? Check this verse out. I love this verse. Proverbs 25, 2. This is, this is kind of wrapping up what I was talking about. 
It is the glory of God to conceal a matter. To search out a matter is the glory of kings. How cool is that? It's God's glory. Like, this Bible is so incredible because it was written for us. It was written, actually, in really plain, simple language that even, like, we can go in Sun City Kids and we can teach them truths out of this Bible, but yet there's people that devote their entire lives, 50, 60 years of their life to study this book, and they're still discovering truths, and it's rocking their world. I want to be like that. Because it's the glory of God to conceal and hide so that we can dig and we can find. You guys want to dig and find what's in the Word of God? Oh, man, there's so much hidden in there. So incredible. So again, we just got to remember, the Bible wasn't written to us, but in the culture it was written to, that was the way things were taught. That was the way things were understood, right? It was the glory of kings to search out a matter. And the Bible actually says that you and I, we are a kingdom of priests in 1 Peter. So there we go. We're kings, queens. I don't know if you knew that. Um, just for you today, for you. Like I said, the Bible is written for us, not to us. How about this thought? Who? Who is the main character? Jesus, right? The kids said it for us. I love that. It's always the right answer in church. You guys are rocking it. You're doing really good. The main character of the Bible is Jesus, okay? Sometimes when we're reading the Bible, we're reading the Old Testament, we're trying to understand, man, what is this all about? Like, how does this even work? But if we can look for Jesus, even in the Old Testament, man, he starts jumping off the page. He starts revealing his character to us. Now, here's what I'm talking about. Sometimes when we're reading the Bible, we can read the story of David and Goliath, which is an incredible, incredible story about little tiny shepherd David defeating this big giant named Goliath. And we can read it, and we can put ourselves in the story as David, which I think is pretty cool, right? We can, we can think about how I need to be more courageous, and I need to stand up against the things in my life, right? And I need to declare the word to those things. But again, look at that story in light of what if Jesus is David, what if, what if there's Goliath in your life and my life taunting us and yelling at us day after day after day, and we don't know what to do? We're paralyzed in fear. We're stuck on this battle line. But then Jesus shows up on the scene, and Jesus starts telling Satan to go to where he belongs, right? And then, and then Jesus is the one charging after the enemy, taking him out, cutting off his head. That's a cool way to read that story, right? <laughs> Again, like, what about, what about, we go back into, like, Moses, when, when God's people, the Jewish people, they're held captive in Egypt by Pharaoh, right? They're in, in slavery for hundreds of years, and God calls on Moses to go deliver his people. Now, we can read that story like we're Moses, and we can think, okay, God, you could use me. You could go into a place, and I could speak justice, which we all should. But again, look at that story as if Jesus is Moses, right? Pharaoh has held all of these people captive and we look at that story, what if Jesus is the one showing up, saying, hey, let my people go, yeah. right? Like Jesus is all throughout the Bible if you read it, read it that way. So Jesus is the main character of the Bible. All right, what is the Bible? This one's a big one. So give yourself lots of space on your page when you're taking notes. Um, last week, I love this. Even Rowdy in the video said it's a collection of books. It's 66 books. So sometimes we talk about this is the book, right? Danny talked about Bible is just... Biblios in the, in the you know, ancient world, it was where they made books, and so that's where we got the term Bible. But it's not necessarily a book, it's a collection of books. That's how it works. Um, he's, Danny shared this last week, but it was written over a period of 1,600 years in over a dozen countries, three continents, by 40 different people in three different languages. But again, one word. How beautiful is that? I loved even what Danny said last week. Like It just proves the existence of God, just that simple fact right there. Right, that it all flows. Um, the Bible wasn't originally written in English. Did you guys know that? Wow. Yeah, I know, right? Um, you guys are learning so much today. No, honestly, a lot of this today, like, I'm not insulting your intelligence. A lot of this today, my goal is not to maybe tell you something you don't know, but to stir your excitement about the Word of God. Because here's the deal. Like, you guys know this. The more we know something, the more we can fall in love with it. Right Now, we all have experiences when we get close to something or someone, the more we learn about someone, maybe we're actually turned off or put away by what we're learning about. But what's so cool about the Bible, guys, every time we lean in, every time we dig in, every time we find out more, we just fall more and more in love with the Bible and more and more in love with God. So today, my goal, like Danny said last week, Danny said his goal was to help you guys fall more and more in love with the Bible. Guess what my goal is today? 
to help you fall more and more in love with the Bible, okay? So here we go. Um, the Bible wasn't originally written in English. Um, English wasn't even a language when the Bible was written, so there. Um, like, God could have if he wanted to, but he didn't, because uh, English wasn't even around. Um, by the way, there are over 7,000 languages spoken in the world. Pretty crazy, right? Now, the Bible, the full Bible, has only been translated into 700 languages, now, still, that represents 6 billion people of the however many billion people are on earth right now. So most, the majority of the people on, on the earth have a Bible in their translation. But honestly, that is a heart cry for a lot of people. How can we help this get translated into every tongue so that every nation, so that everyone can have a Bible? There's incredible ministries that focus on that. Okay, but so like I said, 7,000 languages, only 700 translations but English, this blew my mind when I read this. English translations, there's estimated there's 900 English translations of the Bible. That doesn't seem fair to me. Does that not seem fair to you either? It's like, come on, let's translate some other languages. But that begs the question, okay, if this is an old book written in other languages and it's been translated, how do I even pick a translation to read? Anybody ever have that question? Or is my translation the right one? Like, how do I know? Is mine actually the word of God? Or did it get messed up along the way? Anybody have these thoughts? I have these thoughts sometimes. Okay, so I want to talk to you briefly about by the what is the Bible and how is it translated? There's three different main types of translations. In graphics team, you can throw up this cool graphic. We'll kind of walk through it together. This is a really, really cool way to think about different translations of the Bible. Okay, first off, there is the word for word translations. So they literally take the original language and what is that word? And they give it an English word and then we read it that way, literal word for word. So there's some examples there the NASB, the ESV, the old school King James Version. That's how that one was translated. They added like these and thous too, just to make it more difficult to read, I think. Um, but that's, the, that's where that one falls. You can see other translations that we go across. But then there's these thought-for-thought thought translations, okay, where they take what is, what is the author trying to say, but like how do we say that in English that flows better, that's more readable, right? Because like for instance, I'll just give you an example. If I'm speaking Spanish, the way I would say, hey, like the house is yellow, I would say the house yellow, right? That's like, I don't know all the Spanish words. I should have looked the casa... I know Roja, Rojo. Amarillo, thank you. Yeah, the house yellow, right? That's how I say it in Spanish. And if I translate it in English, I say the house yellow, but we say the yellow house. Does that make sense? So the thought for thought, they fix the words a little bit so it's more readable to you and I. So some translations that fall in there um, would be the NIV. That's a really popular one. I currently am reading the New Living Translation, and I love the New Living Translation. I read my Bible early in the morning, and my brain is still connecting synapses and stuff, and so it's just easier and I love the New Living Translation. It's a great Bible. And then all the way over on the right, we have a type of translation we actually call a paraphrase. And it's not an actual translation. It's like we're, we're paraphrasing the big ideas and the thoughts so that people can understand it better. These are beautiful, beautiful tools. I have taken like a year of my Bible reading and just read a paraphrase. And honestly, what I love about paraphrases is it helps you just see the Bible afresh and anew. Right? It's just like, it's a cool way to say it. One of my favorite all times, you guys are probably familiar with it, as far right as you can get, the message translation. Eugene Peterson did a beautiful job paraphrasing. Now, some people get all like, oh, it's not the actual Bible. Listen, he originally sought, he was a pastor, and he was trying to write the Bible to a small, trying to teach the Bible to his small group, and he found that they kept getting tripped up on the words. So all he started to do was rewrite it in a way that they could grab it. Okay, so if I'm reading it in the message, I'm thinking, oh, this is just so I can understand it better. Even the other one, I think it's the Living Bible. Again, that was written to children so that children could grasp the Bible better. So like I said, multiple different translations. How do you pick the right one? Here's the big answer. How do you know or how do you pick which translation? Pick the translation you're going to read. Yeah. Amen? <laughs> Does that make sense? Like if you pick, oh, like I'm going to go for the real hard stuff, but you're not reading it? and it's just hard for you to understand, don't pick that translation. Amen? Or like maybe you've been reading one for a long time and it's just kind of you're going through the motions, then pick a different one. Um, there's no right one, no wrong one. Pick a translation that you're going to read. Amen? What is the Bible? We're in this whole what part. 
Um, here's the deal. It is historical. The Bible is historical, but it's not like a history book per se. So sometimes when people get to the Bible, they're like, well, this one book said it this way. and This genealogy leaves out certain names, and this isn't totally accurate the way it was written down. Here's the deal. Okay, when the authors were writing it down, again, we got to remember they were Eastern, and a lot of times when they wrote, it was way more of like poetic, and they were trying to connect dots, and they were trying to show you things, and they were trying to highlight things. So sometimes they even took a little bit liberty, like I got messed up for the longest time, guys, in Matthew when he's talking about the genealogy, and he's like, this many generations to this many generations, but it's not actually that many generations. I was like, that's not fair. How could he do that? He's lying. It's like, no, really what Matthew is trying to do is highlight Jesus and highlight the origins of Jesus and where Jesus came from. Because Matthew wasn't setting out to write a detailed, documented view of Jesus' genealogy. He was trying to show the Jewish people that, hey, this guy, Jesus, he's from the tribe of Judah. And it's a really, really big deal. You should pay attention to this guy. So again, not necessarily a history book. It is historical, but it's full of poetry. It's full of incredible literary devices. Even sometimes when you read Paul in the New Testament, he's like, he's throwing out words of slang that people said in his time. And like he would say a phrase and you read that and you're like, that doesn't even belong. For instance, when he says, should we just all sin? Should we all just eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die? He's like, no. But we could read that and say, hey, the Bible says that we should all just sin right? You got to understand what you're reading. There's poetry. There's um, like letters written to people. It's beautiful, beautiful, beautiful book. Um, there's the Old Testament and the New Testament in this Bible. And for a while, I don't know why, I thought it was in the middle, um, but it's not. Like the New Testament is only like that much of the Bible. And so like I got confused for so long because I'd flip to the middle and Psalms is in the middle. But New Testament, it's only a little bit at the end and it's not even that new, Honestly, did you catch that? Like, it's still like over a thousand years old. It's not that new. Why do we call it the New Testament? And there's an Old Testament. How does it all work? Okay, in the Old Testament, they were all the writings before Jesus came. And then the New Testament, it kicks off with four gospels telling us the incredible story of Jesus. Then right after that, we have the book of Acts that talks about what happened after Jesus ascended, after he died. It's all the stories of the, the beginning of the church and what his disciples did. Then all these letters. It's an incredible, incredible collection of books. But here, this might help somebody today. This is, in general, the way I think about Old Testament versus New Testament. Okay, so this is Chris. If you have any problems, you can email danny at suncitychurch.com, Okay. <laughs> This is, in general, the way I read the Bible, and I think it'll help you, okay? So again, big, broad strokes, but I love thinking about it this way, okay? We have the Old Testament, and we have the New Testament. When I'm reading in the Old Testament, and I see all this crazy stuff, like wars and, like, genocide and all this stuff, I think, okay, physical, right? God was, like, showing a physical kingdom on earth, but then when we flip over to the New Testament, I tend to think spiritual, Right? I tend to think, okay, like God's doing a work in the spiritual. Let me give you an, a couple examples, right? Okay, Old Testament, I said a couple of them. Um, God's people, Israel, they were held captive by Pharaoh, right? They were, and then they needed a deliverer to come in and let the people go. So they were delivered, they went through the Red Sea, right? And then they were beginning to go to the promised land. Well, over here, New Testament, like Jesus says, we're held captive by our sin. And we need to be delivered from our sin. And when we actually get water baptized, right, like in the waters of baptism, it's not some magical thing that happens, but it's a spiritual symbol. Like I'm dying to my old self and I'm being raised to new life. Does that make sense? Actually, someone told me a joke last week um, after service. We're talking about the Bible. And they said that someone back in the day wrote into the Reader's Digest and they said, um, hey, by the way, when Israel left Egypt and they crossed the Red Sea, it actually wasn't the Red Sea. It was actually the Reed Sea. They were farther south and, you know, millions of people. And it was only actually like a foot or two deep. And so it really wasn't, it wasn't that spectacular that Israel like crossed through the Red Sea because it was really shallow. And the author, the Reader's Digest author replies and says, oh my gosh, that's a miracle. Right? And then the person writing in says, what are you talking about? I just told you, like, they, it was just a foot, like, two feet deep max. Yeah, could you imagine all of Pharaoh's army and all those soldiers and all those chariots drowning in a foot of water? 
That is a miracle. I would love to see that, right? But again, it's that approach, like that faith. So again, Old Testament, New Testament. We have physical, we have spiritual. I wrote down a couple more. Uh, what about this one? Oh, this one's beautiful, Passover. Okay, Old Testament, um, God's people, they're held captive in Egypt by Pharaoh, and God is delivering them. And so one of the plagues is the death angel is going to come through and kill every firstborn, but the death angel will pass over everyone that has a lamb, that sacrifices the lamb, and puts the blood over the doorposts, right? And that's when Israel was delivered, and that was Passover that they celebrate, okay? They had a lamb, and they sacrificed it. Check it out. New Testament, Jesus rolls up on the scene and the first thing John the Baptist says when he sees Jesus, he says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world because Jesus was going to be our Passover Lamb. How crazy is that? So again, Old Testament, I see, I see Israel going into the promised land, but they have to kick out all the enemies. So there's like killing and blood and crazy and all this stuff over here. Well, New Testament, guess what? Our battle isn't against flesh and blood, but it's against principalities and powers, the New Testament says. So what we, we're not fighting physical enemies anymore, but we are fighting a real enemy right? He's the enemy of our souls. And, and like he tempts us with sin and distraction and all these things. And it's still a battle we fight. Like that song we sing, I'm calling on the God of David, right? I may not face Goliath, but I've got my own giants. Remember that song, right? Yeah. So we're not going to face those physical enemies like there was in the Old Testament, but we do have some spiritual opponents over here. So again, when I read the Old Testament, I think, how does this apply to me spiritually? What's the application of the Old Testament? What's the spiritual principle that God is teaching me in this moment? Does that help anybody? Again, danny at sunsitychurch.com if you don't like it, okay? How about this one? Where was the Bible written? Where was it written? This is so important because culture is so important. If anybody has ever traveled internationally, you know that our culture is different than whatever that culture is, right? Just we do things differently. And if we're not careful, if we're in a separate culture and we don't understand that culture, we could easily offend somebody. Or we could easily be offended ourselves, right, if we don't understand that culture. Well, again, the Bible, it actually is helpful and really, really fun to begin to unpack where was this written and what culture was going on. Um, in Sun City College, I get to teach Life of Christ, and it is such a fun class. But we do, we take a ton of time studying and learning about the culture of the Bible, because there's so many customs, there's so many things going on that it's just really easy to read right by if we don't totally understand them. Um, what were they like over there? They were, they were into farming, they were some were nomadic, right? They were fishermen, so all these things played into the culture. Now, in the New Testament, the Romans, they were very advanced, they were like the known superpower of the world back then. They were super advanced. They had these incredible roads and water systems. But guess what? They didn't have electricity. Um, they didn't have cell phones. I don't know if you knew that. Uh, they didn't have computers and the internet. So again, when we read the Bible, like how come the Bible doesn't talk about this? Well, maybe this wasn't there then, okay? Or like even dating. We, honestly, in, in Sun City Youth, we talk to the, the kids, the students a lot about dating. Well, the Bible doesn't say anything about dating, yeah, because they uh, were like fixed marriages and parents determined. Do you want us to do that for you? Does that sound good? <laughs> so again, we have to understand the culture of where the Bible was written. Okay, when? We've already talked about this. When was the Bible written? It was written thousands of years ago, but it's still relevant to us today. How crazy is that? Again, speaking to the miracle of the Bible. Yes, it's not going to tell us how to parent our cell phone very well, um, right? When to put our cell phone to bed and all that stuff. But it will give us principles, right, and insight into all this stuff. Um, but it does take work to understand it and apply it because, again, it was written so long ago. How about this one? This is interesting. I read this this week. Um, anybody remember, like, in high school or college studying Shakespeare? Yes. Okay, some of you love it, which is awesome, and I love you, but I didn't love it. Honestly, just talk normal, please. Like, just, like, what is the didactic thing that they do all the time? No, the iambic pentameter. Please just write normal. Don't write an iambic <laughs> pentameter, and I have to, like, I'm not even going to try to explain to you what that means right now. But for, for instance, listen to this. Check this out. Um, Hamlet was written right before the 1600s. So a little over 400 years ago, right? And it was written in English. Hamlet, 400 years old, written in English. We struggle to understand it, right? We take classes, college classes about it. I think we should remember that sometimes when we approach the Bible. 
This was written thousands of years ago in different languages. And so if I don't get it at the first reading, I don't just go, oh, well. No, I'm going to study it. I'm going to figure out what does this say? How does this work, right? So just remember, it was written a long, long time ago. Okay, we're getting to the most important stuff. Why was the Bible written? Why did the authors pick up pen and paper? Why did they write this stuff down? Because again, no printing press, no computer. It was very tedious and very expensive to write anything down. Fun fact, actually, they have discovered a lot of letters from the New Testament era. They were written, you know, two other people exchanging dialogue back and forth, and they're really, really short. Okay, kind of like the old school telegraph where you had to pay for how many clicks you did, like, because they had to pay for that paper. And so really, really short letters, with the exception of Paul. Paul, he had so much to say, and God was pouring out all this stuff that his letters are super long because he felt like what God was saying was really important, and he had to get that information across. So why? Why did these writers write it? This is a big, big idea. So remember this or write this down. This book is a unique book. What's so cool is when you pick up any other book, the goal of reading is to consume the content and understand the content. What is the author trying to get across? What am I supposed to learn? But this book, when we read this book, it's not necessarily to consume the content. It's to understand the author. It's to understand, okay, what is God like? How does God think? How does God love me? I don't approach other books like that. For instance, in the lobby right now in our bookstore, we have this incredible book. It's called Practicing the Way by John Mark Homer. I would highly recommend it. I read it. I loved it. I'm applying it to my life. But I'm trying to consume the content and apply it to my life. But I don't care so much, or it's not my goal to go meet John Mark Homer and become his friend. Right? Like, I'm not thinking, what is this guy like? And how can I get in his head? And how can I become more like him? No, I'm reading the book to learn. But when I read the Bible, I'm trying to discover who is God, right? I'm reading not just for the content, but like, who is God? I love this. In John, this is why John wrote some of the stuff he wrote. It says this in John 20, verses 30. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah. So why did John write them down? What was his goal? So that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. So, so cool. I think it's the end of John's book when he said, if I wrote everything down, not even all the libraries on earth could contain all the miracles that Jesus did, right? He's like, I kind of gave up writing, but I wrote these down so that you would believe. That's why John wrote How about Luke? Luke is one of the gospel writers. Luke is a doctor. It's an incredible, fun gospel to read because he's very particulate, uh, particular in the articulates, whatever, of the, the Bible. But this is what Luke said. I love this. Many people have set out to write accounts about the events that have been fulfilled among us. They used eyewitness reports circulating among us from the early disciples Check out this. Having carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I also have decided to write an accurate account for you, most honorable Theophilus, like his friend. Theophilus just basically means lover of God. Pretty cool. So that you can be certain of the truth of everything you were taught. So why did Luke write? He wanted this friend and all of us to be certain of that which we were taught. So cool. So that's the who, what, when, where, why of the Bible. But what about the big why? Why should we care, right? Why should we care about what the Bible is all about? Why are we having this whole conversation today? Where do we go from here? Here's our big why, okay? It's life. This is life to us. I can't even begin. Like, we we don't have enough time. Nothing has changed my life like this has changed my life. I've gone to Bible college. I've had incredible mentors. I've been in small groups consistently for the last 22 years, right? I have an incredible wife. I have incredible parents. I've gone through some really hard things. But honestly, this thing, more than any other thing, has changed my life because this is life to us. Jesus, Jesus' famous words, right? He's out in the desert being tempted by Satan. And Satan's like, if you're hungry, of course you are. You've been fasting for 40 days. Jesus says this. Like in response to Satan, he says, people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. We live by this, guys. This is why this matters to us. 
Um, again, thinking about like the, the going from the physical to the spiritual, from the external to the internal. Why does it matter? Hebrews. But this new covenant I will make with the people of Israel that on that day, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their minds and I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. In the Old Testament, they had tablets of stone. In the New Testament, it gets to come on the inside of us and change the way we live. This is life to us. Another reason why, Romans 12 too, probably one of my favorite verses. We're gonna break it down in just one second. I think I have time. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person. How? By changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. I love that challenge by Paul. This book can change your life, and it will change your life. If you give it time, if you give it priority, if you make it your goal to dig in and understand. Remember, it's the glory of kings to search out a matter. I would just encourage you, man, search it out. It is incredible. A.W. Tozer, incredible author, uh, one of my favorite lines. It's the beginning of his book, Knowledge of the Holy. He says this, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Gosh, think about that for a second. When you and I think about God, what comes into our mind at that moment is the most important thing. So if I think, oh, he's just an evil dictator, that's gonna change the way I live, right? But if I think, no, he's a loving savior, that's gonna impact me. If I think, oh, he's just like a distant God, far off, created the universe and then like left it. Or if I think, no, he came down from heaven to earth, like incarnate, Emmanuel, God with us, that changes the way I think. And what's crazy about that is it's almost a self-fulfilling prophecy. I can learn more about God and change the way I think about God, therefore change who I am. Isn't that crazy? So let's dig in. Let's learn more. How do we do it? Glad you asked. Who, where, when, why, how? You guys were like, hey, you didn't do the how. I just am now, okay? <laughs> Here we are. I love our creative team. Um, in the seat, bo- seat back pocket in front of you, you have these little hot sauces again. Last week, I was like, Tabasco's okay, but I like Cholula better. So I got Cholula. You guys like that? Isn't that cool? Yeah, love it. On the back, you'll find some QR codes again, and I couldn't do three. I had to do four. I apologize again to the media team, but there we go. Um, Right at the top, again, Sun City College. We kick off this fall. If you're interested at all about checking out the classes we offer or how it's going to work, we're having an online option this year. Scan that QR code. Find more information about it. Um, But something I like, this is dumb. Um, Actually, I'll get to that in a second. But get a paper Bible. Danny talked about that last week. I love reading digitally. Even this morning, I was a little bit short on time, so I read digitally on my phone with my AirPods and let it read to me. It was early. But I love my paper Bible. I love opening it and reading it and marking it up. So get a paper Bible. Again, which translation? The one you're going to read. Okay, we have some incredible ones. The books are out there. There's tons on Amazon. Maybe you've never checked out the message. Check out the message. It'll be really, really fun. Um, I The second link on there, it's the... I don't get any kind of kickback from Amazon for this, I promise, okay? Um, the Bobino bookmark pen. It's really, really dumb. I don't go anywhere without a pen in my Bible. And this one's dumb. It's like nine bucks. You know what's funny on Amazon, too? It says, for women. And I'm like, what well, makes a pen gender-specific that way? So I was like, I'm going to get one because... I don't know why, but what I love is it's thin and it's just in my Bible and is there all the time with me, okay? Because what it does is it reminds me that this is a conversation back and forth. If I'm just reading and checking a box, but if I have my pen there, I have it in my hand when I'm reading and I'm circling things, I'm underlining things, I'm starring things, I'm like referencing other things and so mark up your Bible. Remember Poncho Louder? A dirty Bible equals a clean mind, right? A clean Bible equals something else, okay? Um, But I have a clean Bible here. Look at how clean that is. Shiny. Um, Something I did this week, I was inspired by Danny last week. I bought a new Bible. Um, Another link on there is get a study Bible or another thought. This is a study Bible, okay? And study Bibles are really cool because they have the regular text, but then at the bottom they have thoughts and commentaries and stuff you could read further. So maybe if you're newer to the Bible, I would even consider a study Bible. It just helps you dig in a little bit more, search things out. This one is called the Fire Bible. 
Ooh, just sounds cool, right? Um, but there's the Life Application Bible. There's the Spirit-Filled Life Bible. There's all these, like, study Bibles. And again, it just has extra articles. The beginning of each book, it even tells you, like, when was this book written and who was it written to and who wrote it and why. But again, these are just tools to help you dig in. And then the last one, the Bible Hub, okay? The link on there. Um, I'm going to throw this graphic up on the screen, uh, but if you want to scan that code, this takes you to just a free app. Danny talked about Olive Tree uh, last week. Um, there's a ton of different Bible study tools you could use, but if you go to the Bible Hub, you can find something like this, okay? It's kind of small, so you can squint. Um, a lot of you are like, man, that looks like Greek to me, because it's Greek. <laughs> Isn't that cool? Um, but this is really fun. So if you go to the Bible Hub and you click on the link interlinear, you can actually read the Bible right parallel with how it was written in the original language. It's so fun, guys. And um, I want to show you something really fast, and then we'll wrap up service. But this is Romans 12, 2 again. So you notice, like I'm just going to read the red words, and notice how terribly it reads in English. And not be conformed to the age this, but be transformed by the renewing of the mind for to prove by you what is the will. See how that works? Because again, that's directly right under the Greek. But there's some incredible, incredible words in here. So it says, don't be conformed. The schismatize. See that Greek word there? Like that third word in? That Greek word, it basically means don't be conformed and squeezed into the systems and the molds of the world. Listen, guys, you and me, like we are in a culture, in a society that's trying to squeeze us into a mold and just pump us out like a factory. Paul is saying, don't be squeezed into the mold of this world. But look at, he says, but be transformed. That word right there, metamorpho, is the word metamorphosis that we get from. And that's that idea of a caterpillar crawling into the cocoon and coming out as a butterfly. What is God's desire for us? For us to be transformed from the inside out. How? By renewing our mind, spending time with him, hanging out with God, hanging out with his word. Isn't that so fun? Oh, man. I pray, my desire is that we fall in love with the word more and more and learn more about him. But that all starts with getting to know him. Maybe, maybe you're in this room and you're hearing all this talk about the Bible and you're like, man, I've tried to read that book. It's hard to understand. I don't know where to start. I've tried and I've only made it so far. And you're talking like it's crazy and fun. It's just not very fun. Honestly, maybe your thing is right now, here today, you need to confess your sins to God and begin that relationship with him. The Bible actually talks about inside of us, we have a spirit, and that spirit is dead unless we know God. And when we come to know God, John chapter three is a beautiful chapter about Jesus interacting with a religious leader, and he says, you have to be born again. Your spirit has to come alive, because Jesus said, my words, they are spirit and life. And if our spirit is dead, it's hard for us to understand. So in just one minute, one second, I'm gonna give you an opportunity. Maybe today's your day when your spirit is gonna come alive. Or maybe you've prayed that prayer a long time ago, but you've walked away and you wanna say, God, I'm coming back to you. I want you to make my spirit alive in you again. So again, nothing magical, nothing crazy, but I'm just gonna ask you when I count to three, if that's you, to raise your hand and all, all of us, the whole church, we're gonna pray a prayer together to begin that relationship with God. So let's all just bow our heads, close our eyes. And if that's you, if you want to begin that relationship with God, it just starts with a prayer, and then it goes on an incredible, incredible journey of discovering more about him. But if that's you, um, raise your hand as a count to three. One, two, three. And go ahead and look up, look up at me, too. Yeah, I see you back there. Awesome. Yep, see you, too. Really, really cool. Awesome. Hey, you guys can put your hands down. Awesome, church. Let's just pray this prayer all together and mean it, even on the inside of it. I love praying this prayer every single week. Say, Father God. I believe in you, and I believe in your son, Jesus, who came to earth and lived a perfect life and died on the cross for my sin. And right now, I confess all of my sin before you. I ask you to wash me clean and make me new in you. God, I give you my life. I make you my Lord. Fill me with your Holy Spirit so that I could live a life that pleases you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Come on, church, let's celebrate with those that made that decision.
What an incredible, incredible journey you just are embarking on today. Man, so fun. And like grab a Bible. If you don't have a Bible, honestly, we have some free ones in the Welcome Center over there. Or if you want to purchase one, there's some in the um, bookstore over there on your way out. Uh, But at this time in our service, I'm going to invite our ushers to come forward. Our prayer team can come up as well. Um, But if that was you, if you raise your hand, um, I would strongly encourage you, man, fill out a Connect card and just check the box. I received Jesus today. We would love to follow up with you and help you with any resources, any questions you have. Or like I said, if there's a prayer request that you have, write it on that Connect card. Drop it in the offering bucket when it goes by. Um, Even um, in just a second, our worship team is going to play. If you need prayer for anything, our prayer team is here to pray with you right now. So I would encourage you to come up and do that. Uh, But church, let's pray for today's offering. God, right now, thank you for your word. God, we thank you that it's life to us. We thank you, God, that even every good and perfect gift, God, it comes from you. So even now as we receive our tithes and our offerings, God, it's just our joy to give back to you. God, we count this as joy just to sow back into your kingdom. God, and we pray that you would take this offering and do more than we could ever even imagine or think. God, help it translate the Bible into more translations. God, help it tell other people all across the world about how much you love them. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Awesome. The ushers are going to pass the buckets. And then as they pass, I would invite you to stand up. Let's worship together uh, before we close our service.